I shouldn't push on that, but I find it very important that we have recordings of these talks because there's a lot of people that need this information that we do here, but they cannot afford a ticket or they cannot afford going to another city, but they can afford watching, uh, watching YouTube. So I think it's very, very important that we, uh, that we share the knowledge that we have not only to the people who are here, but to the world as a whole because that's where people learn things. And I think the internet is one of the best resources for that and we're not using it enough. The amount of views that I see on conference talks is so minimal. Just send this stuff around, tell people about it, show it in your company. We as speakers, we live for that. We're sad, lonely people. We, we want people to know about what we're doing. Okay, uh, so we're ready for this, so thanks very much for showing up. I got 40 minutes with a lot of slides and I'm happy to answer any questions later on as well, so I'll be around for a while. I'm talking about progressive web apps here today and I was fascinated that when I had conversations in the hallway here, people were just, ooh, what's progressive web apps? Because I've been in a lot of front-end conferences where it's the topic for the last two years and everybody talks about it. So I want to explain today what progressive web apps bring to you and how to build them, but I'm not going to do live coding because there's 10,000 courses out there that teach that to you much better and the resources of that will be available in the slides afterwards and on my Twitter feed and whatever. So first of all, I'm Chris Heilman. I'm a big fan of the internet. I'm CodePoet on Twitter. If you need pictures of hedgehogs, kittens, and JavaScript advice, that's a good place to follow me. Uh, there's a lot of tweets. People accuse me of having uh, people that actually tweet for me. No, it's really me. I just have a mobile with me all the time, and this is the great thing about the internet nowadays, that we can do it from wherever. Weird that people ask us to actually work in an office and move to a certain city to work for them, right? Should be possible that way. So the web is not doing too well right now. I gave a keynote in Sweden about this where I pretended to be a, uh, a psychologist that interviews a depressed internet. Don't know why my partner said it's a good idea. But there's so many problems that are going on with the web right now. There's censorship, of course. There's bullying from people on social media. There's trolling of people on social media. There's malware that is happening with just a click of a button. Uh, there's surveillance, people basically tracking you, people looking at you. And there's security issues, of course, which is kind of going into the malware thing, but a lot of things are just not secure and people are not caring enough for the end user's data to keep them secure. And of course, the biggest problem to me is obesity. And not obesity of the people doing the internet stuff, but the internet itself. There's a great website called HTTP Archive where you can see the average size of a website nowadays. And this is what's happening here. We got 1.4 megabyte of, a, uh, of website data. A lot of it is images, a lot of it is JavaScript, a lot of it is like fonts and video. And I don't know how we came to get there. When I started with the internet, I loved that everything was small, immediate, and I get the information that I need. But we don't have that any longer. Nowadays, just because of developer convenience and because of other business reasons, we put as much as we can into every website that we have out there. And if you think about it, if you go to another country like I am right now and I'm on data roaming, and my, your website costs me as much as a ticket to the cinema, it better be as exciting. And most of them, they're not. Most of them are just pushing things in my face that I don't need and hiding the information that I really came for. So considering our users, this is worrying because a long time ago, we moved away from desktop machines to laptops to mobile phones. All new users are mostly on mobile devices. Of course, there's desktop machines for B2B systems. There's like uh, all the things that you have to use, like room booking systems, expense systems that are much more fun on desktop. But the most of the new end users are going to be on mobile devices, and we're losing them. Because kids nowadays don't care about the internet too much on their mobile phones. They use Snapchat, and I still don't know what Snapchat does. I try to understand it all the time, but I'm like, OK, what are you doing here? This is just bizarre. You're sending videos of yourself that go away. And OK, fair enough. I mean, they make money, so I'm happy with that. But it's just, to me, it's fascinating that that resource, the internet, that I love to bits and I've been working on for 20 years, is going away. And people don't see the appreciation of it anymore and don't understand that it is actually a, a great gateway for somebody who cannot afford education or has a country where they don't educate you enough, where they can learn things that they don't know about. I remember cycling to the, cycling to the library and reading books when I was a kid. Nowadays, I could open my laptop and find all the information that I want. Instead, I watch 15 episodes of Game of Thrones. <laughs> so 
the web, the problem with the web was, because that happened, is the web wasn't ready for the mobile form factor. It was actually made for the desktop web, for the desktop environment. It was made to be linked documents from different universities talking to each other. So what we had is like the mobile was a throwback to the web of old. Out of a sudden, we had really small screens, bad connectivity, and unreliable browser support. This is what my job was in 2001, where it, the resolution was 640 by 480. Internet Explorer 5 or 6 or even 4 was the browser that people used. And I had a <laughs> connection to the internet. And this is what we now have on mobile devices still. And in mobile devices, it's even worse because the connectivity changes every millisecond. No matter where you're actually walking, you might not have connectivity or you have things like Wi-Fi that pretends to be there and then you cannot connect to it if you don't have a key and you don't have access to it and paid for it and so on and so forth. You have constantly changing conditions. Your phone is out of battery, you're, you're, uh, you're in a train, you don't even know how connected you are. And there's hardwired browser and hardware with unpredictable upgrades. That was the biggest problem with older Android devices that came up with a browser that should not have happened and then basically was hardwired to the operating system. When your new operating system was not available for your phone, you got stuck with a browser that was a sad excuse for a browser for the next 50 years to come. And let's not forget that not everybody buys new mobile phones all the time or is on a contract where they get new mobile phones all the time. When I was in India, when I was in Africa, I see people buying second-hand phones. I see people in England, even one of the most, uh, well, for now, richest countries out there, that where people buy second-hand phones and give it to their kids because if they drop that one in the toilet, it's not as much of a problem as the $900 iPhone. So these things are not going away. And it started pretty well, if you remember. When Steve Jobs in 2007 said, you got everything you need, you know how to write apps using the most modern web standards to write amazing apps for the iPhone today. Steve Jobs was all about the web, was all about HTML5, was all about CSS and doing cool stuff in the browser. And then he died and Apple realized there's a different story to the whole thing and it's much easier to make money by controlling people, uh, them and other people as well. So when you go to websites nowadays, a lot of websites are just a, a thinly veiled advertising with lots and lots of videos and images for like, please contact the App Store and download our iOS app or our, or our Android app. Even this conference has an app. I don't want your app. I've been at 23 conferences already this year. I don't want to have 23 apps on my phone that I have to delete two days later. That is 50 meg of data that is really easily displayed in HTML, easily displayed in a browser, and even available offline to you. Uh, interestingly, Forbes had said, like, when, because uh, uh, Steve Jobs was against the app market. He was basically really against the, uh, the, the, uh, the app store. And uh, then uh, Forbes said that in 2014 that the biggest blunder of what he said became the biggest moneymaker for Apple. I w I, there's the URL there. You can read that up. I tried to read that up, but instead I get this. A quote of the day that has nothing to do with the thing. It was on Cyber Monday, so please buy more stuff, because obviously you don't have enough. And uh, out of a sudden, my, my fan started running on my computer, and I didn't know what was going on. And then I looked at it, because I'm a developer, and I look at stuff. And it's a 902-word article, which is cool. That's, that's actually a nice length of, a, of the article. I used to work in radio as a journalist. This is the kind of thing I would write. But it's actually 9.1 megabyte of data. It has 522 HTTP requests, and if anything we said in performance in the last 10 years is like every HTTP request is hurting your users and yourself. Make sure you have as few HTTP requests as possible. It has 52.48 second load time. So I really, really needed to be excited about this article, because normally people after three seconds on a mobile phone go away or wonder if their, if their phone is broken and start complaining about Android or iOS or, or the phone providers. And then under the page, when I saw that, there's from the web. There's this stuff that I didn't come from that is in that page. And there's great stuff in there that I really never cared about. But it's like, obviously, they get money from that. And the thing that started the fan and also started speaking to me out of a sudden, and I thought I had like a, 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 an ephemeral expression to God or something. No, it was just an ad for Barclays where somebody's talked over, and I didn't even find that until I scrolled for like 15 seconds, that there's an auto-playing video interrupting my experience of that news article. Now, I don't, want to, I don't want to harp on Forbes, but they were wrong. 
And uh, then, of course, when you, have, when, you, when you are a security concerned person like me, you have a uh, browser extension running that tells you just how many more people are seeing right now what I'm reading. And there is one called NetBeam from, Microsoft, uh, from Mozilla. That I, when I worked at Mozilla, I worked on that one. And there I now know that 41 different websites get my data and are listening in on me at the moment while I'm reading this. I don't know who they are. I don't know what they do with my data. I don't know if they actually access my history of my browser. I don't know if they access my form uh, validation fields that are in there. But this is what people do nowadays. And we're like, hey, to read this, please click on these and please allow us to set cookies on your machine. So it came on a publisher's dilemma to a degree because on the web, users are in control. I can turn off all your ads. I can turn off JavaScript. I can turn off your images. I can make the thing really break. But I'm not a person that does that because I need to. I might be a person who is blind, who actually cannot see this stuff if your ad is in the way and you didn't make a way for a keyboard to get rid of this modal dialogue. I might be a person that is on a slow connection in Bangladesh, Africa, India, that uses a proxy browser that deletes all the stuff so at least I can get to the content. I might have turned on reader mode in Firefox so I only get your text rather than your 10,000 ads that I didn't want. And users are conditioned to not pay for things but find ways around. That's the biggest issue of the web. For years, we've been saying, like, okay, there's ways to make this cheaper. Hey, you don't need to buy Netflix. There's a streaming website which probably does everything to your computer that can be done wrong, but you can watch the movies that are not available in your country yet. People use the web for piracy or like soft piracy, as I call it, to get around with ways that you don't pay for. So we've been conditioned that way because everybody sold on the web with the concept of free, free, free. Nothing is free. You pay with something. You either pay with money, you pay with your data, you pay with being the training model for the next artificial intelligence system that they're using. You're, being, you're getting no free stuff here. If you don't pay for it, don't trust it. That's what I started to think about. And somehow you have to pay the bills. And as a publisher, you want to make sure you somehow get money and people don't block your ads so you don't get any money. So let's try to turn users into products to sell to others. This is the model of like every social media platform out there. They record what you do, they record what you type, they analyze your photos, they analyze the emotions of your photos and sell them to other people. So out of choice or necessity, people are starting to fight this. So they're using Adblock, they're using the Brave browser, they're using Opera Mini or they're using the, uh, the Puffin browser or the UC browser, browsers you never heard about that have millions and millions of users in Africa and in China and in Russia where people need the internet to be faster. Of course, so Wired uh, famously enough said the web is dead and that applications are the cool new thing. So publishers started to flock to applications and also end users started to flock to applications because they gave them a better experience on their mobile devices and not 10,000 ads you have to click away before you read 900 words. So first of all, for publishers, apps control the look and feel. There's no, no chance that a user can resize the font and make it readable for them because your art use department didn't want the font to be differently sized. So you can control everything in an app. There's a revenue resource. Apps cost money. Internet sites don't cost money. People are don't expecting to pay for an internet site at all. But with an app, we're totally OK to pay for it. And it was simple to pay on, an, on a mobile device as well. You can control the distribution. You can remove them from the market or only offer in certain regions. That's another thing that people always want to have. I've got a VPN that changes my location every two minutes, so people don't know where I am on the planet. But I cannot read some of the content that way because it says it's only in the UK that you can access this video that is 50 years old or something. It's got inbuilt obsolescence. New versions cost more. So you cannot make a new version of your website and ask people for money, but you can make uh, Angry Birds 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and make them to pay money every single time for different ones that they want to use. And you control the environment. Everybody more or less does iOS first and then Android second for the same reason that the web failed in terms of payments. iOS users are happy to spend money and they're probably more affluent as well. Android users are the cheaper ones that want everything for free. And that's sadly enough the truth. I'm an Android user, but... Uh, um, <laughs> and the big fairy tale that publishers got told that apps bring you lots and lots of money and you're going to be successful, whereas the web gives you in a set valley of tears and every user will break your experience that you so handfully crafted. Now, there's a reality check for publishers. The pricing is not working. We got a pricing race to the bottom. 99 cent apps are the things that sell. Anything that costs more 
hardly ever sells. And that's a really, really sad fact of the matter. So all of you give your 99 cent app and then make the game really, really hard to play. So you have to spend money for upgrades all the time. And then before you know it, you spend $50 on the thing just to get to the next level. There's a lock into the marketplace with its own rules and restrictions. Apple can totally take your app away without having to tell you anything about it. And you have then to explain to your end users why your app is not available. And you don't even know sometimes why it's not available. Revenue share with marketplace and OS provider. So every revenue that comes in, you have to give a percentage to the OS provider as well, which is really bad if it's 99 cent that comes in for everyone, every one of your applications. And updates are hard and may be delayed to, by the marketplace rules. So you have to wait two weeks for your app to get upgraded. So that's for a security hotfix. That's a real big issue. And it turns out that people don't want to be locked in. And people are starting to get away from apps and stop using apps. 94% uh, of app revenue comes from 1% of the publishers. And these publishers are Google, Facebook, Apple. And that's about it. As a game developer, you've got like two months where you can sell your game. Then it's not interesting for kids any longer, and they're not going to download it anymore. This is harsh, but it is reality. 80% of the users who download an app fail to become active users. And I see that myself. I try the thing out. It's too annoying. I delete it. I never use it again. I've got so many ghost apps on my phone that don't do anything and just take space away. I actually have a build of Android that tells me when I have used an app for a few months and asks me, do you want to delete it? Because obviously, you don't need it. In-app purchases are where the money is. And these are regulated by the platform and cost a percentage. 60% of apps in the Google Play App Store have never been downloaded. This is amazing, isn't it? But it's not surprising. My brother is a comic book artist, or he tries to be. And uh, I, I, bought him a, I bought him a tablet. And then I'm like, I want to pay, buy him a nice, an Android tablet. I want to buy him a nice painting app. Try to look for a painting app a tablet painting app on the Android store. It's like, paint this cat, paint this elephant, paint this ruby, paint this copyrighted character or that copyrighted character. It's basically the, the people flood the app store with lots and lots of apps that don't make any sense. The average user downloads less than three apps per month. Half of the US smartphone users download zero apps per month. And the reason is that we're busy inside Facebook, inside WhatsApp, inside 10,000 other social networks. We don't even use the other apps any longer. We play a game from time to time. We read books on Kindle. We watch Netflix. We watch these kind of things. But we don't use your app. We only use your app when we need it. And is it worth my time to download 50 meg of data just to use your app when I need it? I don't think so. And that's the biggest problem that we have. Users try out a lot of apps, but decide which ones they want to stop using within the first three to seven days. The average app mostly loses its entire user base within a few months. So that means new marketing round, new, new features, more money being spent on getting people back to your app. Of the 1.5 million apps in the Google Play Store, only a few thousand sustain meaningful traffic. And this is what it looks like. The first few days, you have excitement, and then it dies as really, really fast. And you've got to do the classic marketing materials. That's why I see buses with, apps, uh, with ads for apps on the side. I never understood this. And I wish I could block them, but that's what they have. <laughs> Users spend 80% of their time using just five apps. As I said, Facebook, Google uh, services, map services, uh, uh, Gmail, these kind of things. And the market is full of spam, uh, scams, spam, and senseless craft as well. This was an interesting research uh, by How to Geek that to look for Windows, uh, uh, Windows Office on, uh, on iOS in this case, uh, and uh, on OS X. And in the marketplace, you find like things like the template packs, which are like 150 meg downloads of templates for an app that is not available for your operating system. But somebody makes money by selling those things. So how can we fix this? We want happy users and ethical good publishers who do get paid. That's what I want the internet to be. I published eight books. I wanted to get money for that. That's fine. It's OK to ask for money, but we should actually make it by asking for money in an ethical sense and not just like sell ads or track our users and sell them to other people. And the answer is PWAs. Uh, PWAs is not programmers with attitude, because I just wanted to do that picture. Uh, it's actually progressive web apps. Native install friction blocks 74% of potential customers before they ever see your app. This is what happens. You go to the website that you, paint, that you did with whatever around to get people to download your app. They click on the thing. They go to the marketplace. They're asked to log in. 
They're asked to give their credit card details. They're asked to give a pint of blood and the name of their firstborn. They're asked to, to, cha to chant a certain song, and then they can download the app. Then they download the app, which might break down because the connectivity is bad. So they have to resume downloading the app. Then they install it. Then the app tells them, by the way, we need your email. Like, why am I in a marketplace that knows my email where the app asks me to sign in again for the other thing? Why is that not pulled through? So there's a great resource saying like of 2,000 users, of 1,000 users that want to get your app, in the end you end up, luck, if you're lucky, with 150. And it shows where they drop off in user testing when they don't want to do it any longer. So let's go back to the web um, and with a twist. Because the app model has, uh, has its benefits as well. It makes sense to have a focused experience on a mobile device rather than being inside a browser. It makes sense to have an app that does one thing well rather than like being in a tab next to 10,000 other browsers. It makes sense not to have to type anything in but choose buttons rather than like typing in a URL. Typing in a URL on, the, on, the, uh, on a mobile device was never fun. So we got a twist here. We weren't ready to go out on the web with mobile, so we started to simulate uh, native environments with packaged applications. I worked on Firefox OS, I worked on WebOS, and we had like Windows stuff as well, and Apple had their own stuff, and Google had their Chrome apps. So instead of creating websites that work well on mobile, we packaged them up and submitted them to marketplaces. A lot of the apps in the, in the iOS marketplace and in the Android store are actually just uh, 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 Apache Cordova apps, which are like a web view with an HTML document inside. British Airways is my favorite. I, I fly British Airways all the time, and I load the app, and then it says like, oh, by the way, the, the, the website can't be loaded. And you're like, why is this an app? You know, why, can, why couldn't you tell me from the beginning that the website is down at the moment rather than me starting the app again? In a 1.1 comparison, with native apps, they looked rubbish, and that's really, really bad, and that partly because we put too much stuff on the web. We built on, on large desktop machines with fat connections and great computers and then wonder why on a mobile device the thing is slow and, and doesn't work. You buy a really, really bad Android, connect to this thing, debug on that device, test your systems on that, on a 3G connection. Well, in America you have 3G everywhere, so it doesn't really matter. But um, it's much more important to see what your end users are suffering rather than you having a convenient life as a developer. We get paid to do this job we should be able to contain a bit of hardship that way. That's because they weren't map products. They were native apps built in web technologies. And we, we, we just basically tried to copy what native apps did rather than embracing what the web does. Interestingly enough, the mobile web browsing overtakes desktop browsing as well. A lot of people, as I said, surf on the mobile device and don't understand. I think I got like 167 tabs open in my Chrome on my Android device right now because I just forgot to read them. But I opened them, they are like, cool, I will read it later, that's fine. It would, would sync back to my Chrome, but I don't do that. So we're looking much better these days than we did in the past. So all the functionality that we needed native applications for, like battery status, camera access, device orientation, these kind of things, these are all available in W3C standardized APIs now in the browser and in all of the browsers. I worked on free browsers in my life and I, uh, my job is basically to make them all play nice and not fight each other on features that are only available in one browser. So let's think about the mobile form factor. What does make sense on a mobile device? The first thing is to have a small initial payload. Show the thing as fast as possible. If it's under a second, you're good. If it's more, you will lose people. People are not patient on mobile devices. We're super patient on desktop machines, but on mobile devices, every second is like, oh my god, something went wrong, so I probably need to reboot my machine and whatever. Form factor supporting content. Don't show like 15 uh, uh, columns next to each other on a mobile device where there's no space. If you need a good example for that, go to the GoToCon Chicago website on your mobile device. It's not fun. Form factor supporting interfaces. Uh, make sure that your buttons are big because we've got thick fingers and we're slow with them and we're actually, we, 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 we are in a bad environment where we don't see the screen because light, the sun is coming into your, mo not here, but the sun is going on your mobile device in other countries and you can't see it properly. So make sure you use high contrast. Make sure the interface is as simple to use on a mobile device as possible. Have offline and flaky connection support and this is a very, very important thing. If the thing doesn't work offline, it should not be called an app. Nobody wants an app that tells you all the time you need to go online. This makes no sense. Why is it an app then? 
taking advantage of the power of the end user device. These devices have great machines in them. They've got great GPUs in them. They've got storage opportunities for you. Any byte that is not loaded over the web on a mobile device is a winner. So use local storage, use IndexedDB, use WebSQL if you don't want happiness in your life. Look, uh, look, at, look at storage solutions that actually work across mobile platforms to actually put as much as you can on the user's device so they don't have to load it again because they will be offline and every time you give a user an offline experience, they're happy. Avoid interaction latency. Make sure that the 100 milliseconds, 300 milliseconds when you click on a button really happen. When you have a scrolling interface, don't simulate native scrolling. Use native scrolling instead. Anything that is a bit laggy on a mobile device, people get very, eh, this is not working. Where's my data going? I don't, wanna, I don't want this. I'm going to delete this. So uh, when it comes to money, the best way to bend the retention curve is to target the first few days of usage, in particular the first visit. That way users set up themselves for success. So all the apps, the top 10 apps that actually kept user retention, did the best things in the first few days and showed new features in the first few days and created new features and created better functionality. So the faster you can, uh, you can, inter, uh, uh, you can interact, the faster you can change your application and roll it out, the better. And there's, when there's two weeks of waiting for iOS to tell you, yeah, okay, you can do a new feature now. This is what kills all these native applications. So progressive web apps do all of that for you. Progressive web apps are nothing native, are nothing you need an environment for, are nothing you need to download Xcode or Visual Studio for or something like that. All they are is HTML documents with an application manifest and a new API called Service Worker. And I'm going to explain what they are right now. So the first step is the, web manifest, the app manifest. The app manifest describes that the document is an application and not just an HTML document. It defines the look and feel, full screen, color, screen orientation. It, it, allows you, it asks you which access you need to platform-specific functionality. So you ask up front, OK, this needs camera access. This needs these kind of things. And it's a standardized version of older similar approaches. We did it in Firefox OS, we did it in WebOS, we did it in Chrome OS. But now it's a W3C uh, uh, defined JSON object that basically is on the root of your server and tells prospective search engines and prospective operating systems. This is an application. This is not an HTML document. So this is what it looks like. You have a name. You have a short name. You got the icons. You have the start URL. You have the display standalone or display browser or display whatever if you want to show the browser Chrome or not. It runs in the browser of the operating system or in a web view, basically. So your, st your, your stack is HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And if you haven't taken a look at what these things can do nowadays, there's hardly anything that you cannot do with them that you can do with native ones. The only thing is reading, for example, uh, smart cards or, or, or access to USB is a bit flaky still. But other than that, you can do almost everything in there. A very important part that I forgot about in this slide deck is that uh, uh, to, be, to turn your HTML document into a uh, progressive web app, you need to have HTTPS. This thing needs to be on a secure, uh, on a secure source because otherwise we cannot give you access to the camera. We cannot give you access to the geolocation because any man in the middle, any proxy, any internet hotel thing can actually read along what you're doing with that. So we, it needs to be an HTTPS resource. And in essence, if you're running a server now in 2017 on HTTP that is not encrypted, you're a terrible person and you should be ashamed of yourself. I, I can tell you horror stories and I give security talks about what I can do with an HTTP server on a, on a internet connection in this hotel like this. Make sure you keep your end users secure with, a, with, a, with an encrypted environment. So there's a great system by a friend of mine, uh, uh, Nolan, uh, that works with me called Manifest where you can put the URL in it and it creates the, uh, it creates the manifest for you by scraping what your HTML document has already in there. So if you want to start from scratch, you can actually do that and get the information in there. And that one has been around for quite a while. Even iOS had things like that where you can define to get, a, uh, get an icon on the home screen when you put a manifest file in there. It wasn't a manifest file in iOS. It was meta tags inside your HTML document because why make it easy and uh, cacheable. So it was already there. But the big breakthrough is the service worker. Service Worker is, a new, uh, is an API, not new. It's an API now that is supported by 
uh, most of the browsers out there in one way or another, and I'm going to come back to that in, in, uh, in, in the end. The big players there are Google on Android, uh, Chrome on Android, Firefox on whatever, and uh, also uh, the Samsung browser is also very, very supportive of it. What Service Worker in essence is, is a proxy that is scriptable with, with JavaScript. So it's an HTTP proxy that can do anything that, that HTTP can do for you and anything JavaScript can do for you. So what you can do is you can read content off the web and put it into caches. You can name caches that you put your content in. And these will be on the device afterwards when the user is coming back to your app and it's offline available for them. So instead of just relying on browser caching, which was always like playing bingo or something, you, you basically define the caches by name, you can purge them, you can update them, you can change them, you can, uh, you can have different caches for different environments by reading out what the environment is. So if one browser supports WebP images and the other one doesn't, create one cache of WebP images by converting them in JavaScript to WebP on the fly so end users never need to know why the thing is actually faster out of a sudden. So it allows you to intercept fetch requests uh, and respond with cache requests. So instead of loading everything from the web, you load everything first from the device once it's been loaded there. So the first time you load an, uh, a PWA, it's the same experience like any other website. But as soon as the service worker starts hitting, you can start loading more content in the background and putting it into a background cache for people to get next time. So you see where this is going. This is installing an application by using it, and not in a, in a, in a, very, in a very simple manner. Instead of, use, instead of people having to download upgrades all the time and replace the binary on their device, they just go to the website, and next time they go there, the next version has already been loaded in the background, is available for them. It also means that you have atomic updates of your application. You don't need to up create the whole new application every time. You can just replace parts of it. You don't have to turn your whole website into a PWA. You can to use a subdomain and only turn that one into a PWA. Weather.com is a great example. Weather.com, the American version, is just a normal website. The international version is a PWA because they realize that people in India and places like that using weather.com need a faster, simpler version of it. So if you're not embracing the whole idea of PWAs yet, you can try it with a subsection of your website. Expedia and Booking.com do the same thing with certain hotel bookings, these kind of things, rather than the whole page. You can intercept push events as well. So you can actually push things in the background to other servers. You can actually uh, uh, tell the user that something is happening. So you have uh, uh, notifications and you have update notifications and tell the user, by the way, there's a new version of that. Do you want to load it or do you want to keep doing what you're doing? Rather than like, oh, there's a new version, you're basically shot and now you download everything like that you want to have. And you have sync and periodic events as well. So you can sync content in the background without having to wake up the application. That's another very important part. The biggest problem of the web in the past was you always had to have the thing open to get data. Uh, native applications had background syncing and background content pulling, and uh, the web didn't have that. Now we have it with Service Worker. We can pull content in the background only when it's needed and available for the user next time when they come. So even when they don't use your applications, you can, you can uh, read the content in the background every day or so to make sure that next time they come to the application, they don't only get the state that they left it in, but also the next version already cached on their machine. It allows you for offline functionality to make the application go offline. It allows for push notifications, and that, according to any app provider, is the biggest retention point. Telling people that something is new, that something is available, please come back to our app, is a very, very important thing. It's also a super dangerous thing, because this is going to be the next pop-up window annoyance thing that people are going to push in our face if they're not nice people. Because any new push notifications make me do something. Give me a button to reply to it. Give me a button to do something with it. Just don't tell me there's new content in the app available. I don't care. If, I, if you tell me, like, hey, there's a new notification from your friend, and I can immediately answer in the push notification window without even having to go back to the app, I'm happy to give it that data. I'm happy to interact with it. So get your UX and UI developers to really, really look into what push notifications do, because far too many websites right now, I load them and they're like, hey, can I send you notifications? And I'm like, well, buy me a beer first or something. This is just, you know, I don't want to subscribe to you immediately. And you can do background sync where you keep your application in sync and up to date all the time without the user needing to know. 
So progressive web apps need to be HTTPS. They have a valid manifest with all required properties. They must have a service worker. They start URL defined. The manifest must always load, including in an offline state. So that should be as small as possible. A lot of people just do an app shell and then load the content in the back. And must supply an own navigation independent of browser UI because you might get rid of the browser UI and then people would get stuck. Like, what do I do now? And must be responsive to different sizes and form factors. Don't only think of mobile, also think of tablets, think of HoloLens, think of dogs, cats, cows, whatever you put internet programs in nowadays. We have a completely different world than from just desktop or mobile. Now, first success stories. Alibaba is a global leader in a B2B trade, and they upgraded to a PWA. 76% more conversions, 30% more monthly active users on Android, 14% more on iOS, four times higher interaction rate to add to home screen. Uh, Housing.com, uh, real estate platform in India, 38% more conversions, 40% lower bounce rate, 10% larger average session, 30% larger page load. There's a great website by uh, uh, Jason Grigsby called PWA Stats, uh, where, you, where all these case studies are basically listed that show you the success stories of other companies, what they did to turn their stuff into a PWA. So what about support? Not everybody supports, uh, uh, not every browser supports a service worker, not every browser supports a manifest. And this is where we talk about progressive enhancement. And I've been talking about that for years and years. Progressive enhancement to me is like an escalator. An escalator can never break down. When an escalator is broken down, it's a, it's a set of stairs. Sorry for the convenience, you can still go up there, right? It's a bit more work, but it's actually still working. And this is what we should be building these things for. If service worker and a web manifest is not supported, it's a website. Great. Make it smaller. Make it snappy. Make it beautiful. Make it work really, really fast in a, in a mobile environment, and you'll be happy. And using this, you can support the past. You can support old Android browsers. You can support he who shall not be named. And you can support Netscape. And if you really wanted to. These browsers are not out of the way. Don't make beautiful interfaces for these browsers. People are not used to beauty that have to use these environments. It just <laughs> confuses them. You can support current edge cases, like the Silk browser, like the Puffin browser, like the UC browser, and Opera Mini, which are all in use by a lot of people and you probably never heard about. And after some checking, all the current browsers and what they support can be supported as well. So let's talk about iOS to a degree, because iOS doesn't support any of that. Don't know the reason. I have ideas, but I'm not going to say them publicly. So there's no official timeline when or if Service Worker will be supported in iOS. That is not meaning that it's not supported in, uh, um, in WebKit. The WebKit browser, the open source browser, is, has it in its, in its uh, uh, timeline that it's going to be supported. But Safari, who knows? Now, iOS is 45% of the US market phone, uh, uh, ma smartphone market, and iOS users spend $1.08 per user per app instead of four per 43 cents on Android. These are numbers that are quite, meh, that makes sense to a business person. Let's do iOS only, right? Or let's not care about Android until it's ready. But then you have to think that Android has 86% global market share. So if your product is available and interesting outside the US, you will make more money with an Android app than you will make with an iOS app. And you also are not in the totally controlled, very, very hard to upgrade environment that you're in. That said, Apple allows functionality like meta name, Apple web app capable content, yes, to keep it brief and short. And there is also a Cordova plugin that is a service worker that fixes that for iOS. Um, what about desktop and other form factors? Nobody talks about S desktop much when they talk about PWAs because everybody fixes the problem of the mobile web. The existing PWA implementations still leave web apps as second class in the native apps in many ways. We want to fix that. And that's my colleague, Jacob Rossi, on, uh, uh, who's works, working on the Edge team. On Edge, we're planning on uh, running Service Worker as a Windows service in Windows 10. So instead of, func instead of the browser needing to support it, as soon as you actually run it in Windows you get, uh, and you put it into the marketplace of Windows, you get access to the plumbing of Windows, which does all the stuff that Service Worker does in browser already. It can wake up the browser even when the browser is closed, and it may spawn multiple service workers at once for performance. That's still in discussion. We're discussing these things publicly right now as well. We got a bug tracker where we answer people's questions. That's a really cool thing as well, because when I started on the web, Microsoft was just this dark hole somewhere where, where trolls live or something, and nobody could talk to them. 
but we now available to you. We're also going to change the Edge logo really soon, because if you look at it, it looks like a shower head going into a sink, if you look at the dark blue, which always confused me. Now on Windows, uh, Bing crawls websites, and nothing could stop Bing from crawling uh, uh, um, manifests and realize that these are apps and flag them up in search results or ingest them into the marketplace. So there's a few ideas going around there. Sites with a manifest can go into the Windows Store, and these web apps are then real apps. They're Windows Desktop, Windows Phone, Xbox, HoloLens, Surface Hub, things we released today that I haven't read up yet, many things out there. Now, what I found really interesting is that Google's Webmaster Central blog, oops, fair enough, that Google's Webmaster Central, come on, Mac, good that Google's Webmaster Central blog talked about PWAs as well. And these are people that basically built a website in 2007 and never touched it again. So now they learn about PWAs as well, not only the cool kids that go to conferences like this. So uh, building indexable progressive web apps is explained on the, on the Webmaster Central blog. And it says like it's websites that have taken all the right vitamins. So in essence, a PWA is an upgrade to what you do already. And it gives you only benefits. There's nothing wrong. And it's not much work to do. So thinking about getting into an HTTPS environment, keeping your users much safer, putting a manifest there and putting a service worker there is not much hard work and there's so much to be gained by that. Any web product can become a progressive web app. Not all have to be. If, if your thing is just a blog, I don't want to install your blog as an app. That makes no sense. But if it really is something that I do something with, an app is probably a better idea. You reap the rewards of simple ma single maintenance and upgrade path and the form factor mobile users expect. Mobile users expect an app, you can actually maintain your website and you don't need to do anything extra to upgrade the thing because it upgrades in the background automatically. Apps can hibernate and wake up on demand. There's no need to have the browser open. And what I found really interesting is this. The great thing here about progressive web apps is that it's the power of the link, what made the internet, links that link to other things. The distribution model of a PWA is not a marketplace, it's the link. And what is the cool thing about Link? I can email it to you, I can text it to you, I can send it to you on WhatsApp, I can send it to you on Facebook, I can send it to you anywhere. So by following a link, you install an application and you throw away all the problems that you had with like, go to the marketplace, sign up into the marketplace, oh, you have no credit card, you're not going to get it, these kind of things. You don't need to play by the rules of a closed marketplace, it's just the web, that these are the rules that are there. And you can send people a link by the time they looked at the app, it's ready to use. It is really a try before you buy. And if you just close the browser and you don't uh, put it into, uh, put the icon on your desktop, then you don't have the app and you don't have any craft on your machine either anymore. So in-app purchases are where the money is at and you can do that your, with your own app without splitting costs with Apple or Google or Microsoft or other people. So you just maintain your website and it turns into an app. So for all intents and purposes, PWAs are a good opportunity to slim down the web and make it usable again for people. And that without reinventing the great distribution model that is the web, because sending a link to somebody is a great simple way of distributing your content rather than like going through a packaged marketplace. Now, I'm ending with a few resources that you can play with. Serviceworkers.workers uh, is, uh, is a great website by uh, um, Jake Archibald explaining what service workers do, different, uh, uh, it has different recipes, what to do with a service worker. Uh, there's a Udacity course if you want to learn, learn about offline web applications using Service Worker. There's a, a PWA Summit by Google that was run twice already. So uh, all these videos are available out there and are, uh, you, can, uh, you can look at. Uh, great resources, downloadable as well. There's a PWA checklist that explains all the bits and bobs that a PWA should do and how to test for it and what to do to get the checklist ready. There's a directory uh, of PWAs where you can see what other companies are doing and what's happening with them, so you can try them out. A lot of them are also open source on GitHub, so if you want to take a look at how they've done it, you can do that. There is a, a PWA training course, Progressive Web Apps Training, again by Google, by a good friend of mine, uh, that has a 12-step training course. It's, you can do it in a day. And uh, the, the, we have a beta out, and there's going to be more at build in a few days, where we have a PWA builder as well. So in this one, you just copy and paste the URL of your website, and it generates the manifest for you, it generates the service worker for you, and it generates a binary iOS and Android app from your HTML document just by putting your URL in there. Of course, doing it by hand gives you more, function, more functionality and actually more granular control, but this is a good way to get started. And this is all I had time for, so thanks very much.